we are grateful and very happy to have uh, Sanjeev Gupta uh, with us. He just flew in uh, from London. Um, one of the, I've been here at UCLA for a very, 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 very long time. <coughs> and uh, here at Anderson for a long time, not as long as I've been at UCLA. <laughs> uh, and one of the things that I have been pushing for here at Anderson, and I have regretted for quite some time, is that we don't have enough programs and we don't cover Africa deeply enough. Uh, there's a great program here at UCLA. We have Andy here from the African <laughs> Center. Uh, uh, the scholarship on Africa at the university is amazing. But here at Anderson, we've, it's been one thing. Uh, I've done some work on Tanzania. I run a huge project uh, financed by uh, the Gates Foundation on Africa. We produced four books published by the University of Chicago Press. But that's it, about it. So we are delighted that you're here. <laughs> you're going to fill a huge gap. So um, uh, 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 <clears throat> Sanjeev um, is uh, the executive director of the African Finance Corporation. Is that? That's correct. Yeah. Africa, correct. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, he's going to explain a little bit on uh, how it, uh, it, it works and how it operates. But it uh, provides uh, finance for a number of uh, projects in Africa and uh, uh, very important on infrastructure. And we want to know the details of how the operation, uh, the, the corporation works. It's 30 years experience uh, in the finance uh, sector, associated previously to uh, EY, uh, Ernest Young. Um, and he is an alumnus of the Said uh, School uh, uh, of Business, the Business School at Oxford, and also from the, the Sloan School at MIT. Uh, they are okay schools, not as good as Anderson, <laughs> but, but nothing to be ashamed of, right? <laughs> not shabby, yeah? <laughs> so um, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to um, uh, uh, ask uh, Sanjeev to tell us about uh, his uh, work and talk us about, uh, to us about Africa. Um, uh, in the in <laughs> invitation, we said Africa in some ways is the forgotten um, uh, uh, continent. Um, the Financial Times just published the fastest growing countries uh, in the world, and there are African countries there. Uh, the country that I know the best, which is Tanzania, uh, is not doing that great right now, but for the last 20 years has been one of the fastest growing countries in the world, after a very difficult time. <laughs> during the near area and immediately after the near area uh, years. Um, so again, thank you so much for coming. And now the floor is yours. Um, okay. You know the rules. And then we're uh, going to open up for uh, questions the from the floor. Yeah. Uh, we are also uh, in the 21st century. And we are connected via iPad uh, with a, a lot of students who are in remote locations. Uh, so um, we'll, we'll just see how it goes. OK, sure. thank you, Sanjeev. Right, thank you so much, Sebastian. And um, I'm actually happy that you used the word uh, forgotten continent, because there was a time when it used to be called the forbidden comp continent, right? You were not allowed to go there. And if you, if you went there, you came back and you were quarantined for a while. So at least things have progressed in that sense. <laughs> Um, yes, so I'm Sanjeev. I have lived and worked in the African continent for most part of my working life, um, 30 years to be precise. Um, and in, a, in many ways, you know, for those of you who have read Julius Caesar, I feel a bit like Mark Antony this morning. Because uh, just like Mark Antony went to bury Caesar and not to praise him, I am trying to do the reverse. I'm here to praise Africa and definitely not to bury it. And there's a reason why I say so, apart from the fact that it's, it's paid for my living and, 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 and put two kids through university, uh, which in itself is progress, is because I love Africa. I wouldn't be in the continent if I didn't. I love it, I want it, and I actually have it. So I feel a very, very deep affinity towards the continent, towards its people, towards the work we have done, towards the businesses that we have created. And I brook no acceptance when people criticize the continent. I have a personal problem with it. 
except that one day, a few months back, my daughter, who is 19, who incidentally had an offer to come and study here, and, 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 and with dual apology, he, she didn't accept the offer. She chose a small college in the East Coast, uh, maybe because she probably thought that one day I'll come and teach here or, or speak here, and she didn't want to be embarrassed, <laughs> whatever the case is. But she asked me a question once. And she said, Baba, she calls me Baba. She said, Baba, you've been living and working in Africa for 30 years, and you keep telling me that things are changing and you're part of the solution, but I think you're part of the problem. And that made me think that, yes, of course, 30 years, the perception, the perception of the continent is still so negative. The narrative on the continent is still so uniformly pessimistic. The experiences that people share when they come back from the continent continues to be more negative, more dismal than positive. And that's not the case. My own experience tells me that there is a distinct difference between the perception and the reality. As I joke, that I have not met anybody who went to work or do business in Africa and came back. And not that because he was lost in some strange jungle, but he's actually doing very well for himself or herself. So my own experience, I think, therefore, needs to be told, needs to be shared, because only then will I feel that I've done justice to my adopted home, my adopted continent. There is many businesses that I've been involved in, obviously, over 30 years, as you can imagine. Mostly good, some horribly bad, and some terribly sad as well. Overall, a great experience. And I'm going to share with you one of those. Okay? When we get time during the Q&A, Sebastian, I'll be happy to share some of my war stories, uh, some of my greater anecdotes, which is usually better told over a glass of wine, uh, but, but I shall try and do it without the wine. Uh, but today, as a board member of a corporation called the Africa Finance Corporation, I bring you a story which is real, which is proven, and which continues to go from strength to strength. Africa Finance Corporation was created 12 years back. So it's very new, <coughs> very new, 12 years back. Not by an act of God, not by an act of global governments, but for a change, for a change by African governments. They got together and said, let's create an institution that would invest in what they call the core sector of the African continent, the core being infrastructure. Because I think all of us will agree on one thing, that industry, business, commerce, trade, jobs, healthcare, nothing happens if the core infrastructure doesn't exist. And that has been lacking in the continent. And AFC is a story of how that got created and what we have managed to achieve. A very, very small drop, I must tell you, in the bigger ocean of the sea of opportunities we see in Africa, but nevertheless a story that should give confidence to people. I'll try and spare you what they call the death by PowerPoint syndrome. I'll try and take you through some of the slides which are very busy and only make one or two comments as I go along, and I'll then shut up hopefully in the next five or ten minutes, and I'll be happy to interact after that. I purposely call this AFC and the Africa myth. I'm putting a stake on the ground, and I'm saying that most people believe nothing good is happening in the continent, and that myth needs to be dispelled. Today, AFC, 12 years down the line, is a corporation that operates across 30 countries in the continent. It has invested close to $7 billion in these 30 countries. It has managed and I want you to understand this in the context of Africa. In the period that it has operated in, 
it has managed to achieve a credit rating of A3. Now, in itself, it may not mean anything to you, but when you realize that there is only one other institution in Africa which has a superior credit rating than AFC, and that's called the African Development Bank, you can see the significance of this rating. And that's been achieved in spite of us having shareholders who are governments or private sector players whose their own rating is at least eight notches below us. Unheard of, right? Because normally your rating is a function of your shareholders' rating and so on. Now that is an important achievement for us because that allows us to tap into global capital markets and raise money from global capital markets. So we don't go back to our shareholders. We don't have to. In the 12 years that we have existed, that chart shows you, again, an unprecedented probably, but certainly not unique story, that from year one, we managed to remain profitable. We are one of the few African institutions which have paid dividends consistently, and never, never, as yet, touch wood, don't want to tempt fate, had to go back to its shareholders for new funding. We enjoy unparalleled support, unparalleled, I'm repeating this, from the global capital markets. Just to give you an idea, in October, we did a 10-year euro bond issuance, right? 10-year euro bond, African paper. We didn't even go and meet the bond managers. We opened the books sitting in London, and we had an order book of $2.8 billion in 25 minutes, and we only took 750, because we didn't know what to do with the rest. So what is AFC's business model? Why is it special? Why do people support us? Why do we get the funding in spite of the story and the narrative around Africa? The story is very simple. It's a story that is best captured by two words. By two words and two words only. Forget the bump that my marketing people have put on the slides. <laughs> it's really two words. It's patient capital, patience. And second, engagement. If you don't engage with African governments, if you don't engage with African businesses, if you don't engage with global investors wanting to come into Africa, and if you don't prove to them that you can be trusted, you are patient, and you're prepared to take certain risks that they are not prepared to, you have a winning combination. The second is the time horizon. You know, we have a saying in our risk committee, and this is not a joke, this is serious. In our risk committee, and as you know, some of you have probably done that work already or will go ahead and do that work in future. When an investment officer comes with a proposal for a risk committee or an investment committee to approve, he or she usually believes it's the best investment possible under the earth, right? Under the sun, rather, not under the earth, okay? And we have only one saying to our young guys. We say, this is all very good, but what can go wrong? We have instilled in our people one maxim, that please assume that what can go wrong in Africa will go wrong in Africa. And when it goes wrong, unlike other investors, for whom Africa is an asset allocation game, for us it's our only game. We live, we thrive, we breathe, we survive because of Africa. So we always tell our guys, tell me when things will go wrong. And things can go wrong in many ways. I did say I haven't come to bury Africa, I've come to praise it. But it would not be fair for me not to say that things are complicated. Capacity to understand can be challenging, and therefore we need to engage. Now, a lot is being said, a lot has been said, and a lot will be said around how sustainable is our business practices, right? I was in the UK, as you heard, I came back, come in from London last night, and I was attending Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister's uh, Africa-UK summit, where he talked about how they will go into green renewables, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
And a lot of people believe that in Africa, we don't take that seriously. But we do, because I can tell you, if anybody at a personal level, at a farming level, at a living level, is feeling the global warming already, it's Africa. Because African countries largely do not have artificial irrigation systems, do not have huge amounts of uh, reservoirs to store water, do not have the ability to tap into the renewables. They are suffering. There are large parts of Sahel Desert up in the northwest part of Africa, which is drying out. So sustainability is key to us. It's not just a nice to have. It's not something we want to do because that's, that's the way we'll become a darling to the global investors. Remember I talked about risk, and this is my favorite slide. I want you to look at it a little closely. What does it tell you? Remember what I said, there is a huge and a sad difference between the perception on Africa and the reality on Africa. And that slide tells you that actually in terms of project default rates or credit defaults, the African continent is nowhere near as poor or as bad as you think it is. In fact, it's one of the better ones. And there's no myth to it, there is no story to it, it's fact. So much so that this is MIGA, right? This is the World Bank's insurance corporation which provides political risk insurance and credit risk insurance. They themselves say that their own experience in Africa, by far, when it comes to paying insurance claims, is one of the lowest. But in the same breath, I'll tell you, when you try and buy insurance for our projects, it's still the most expensive. This is not a joke, this is serious. I just finished a credit insurance program for a project of ours where I was paying, believe me, my entire yield on this project is 8%. Do you know how much I'm paying on credit insurance? 1.75. So there is still that assumption that, oh, things have been good, but what if things are not good? That price we are still paying. I'll give you another example. My last Eurobond, our last Eurobond issuance, the one I said, the 10-year money, we are rated A3. But we still suffer from what I call the prejudice premium. Because if you look at the price at which I got our paper, I am paying 15 bips above a similar rated paper outside Africa. So those issues do exist. As I said, risk management is key to us because we believe that we are only going to be successful if we take the trouble to manage risk. Remember I said that we got created by African governments to develop what we call the core of Africa. Core being infrastructure, power, roads, ports, railroads, mining, etc. I just want you to know this because each one of you in your own way are ambassadors and hopefully are going to be avid ambassadors for the African continent, right? I want you to see this as an opportunity, this slide. That today, the amount that is required for African infrastructure investment and the amount that is being deployed, there is a big gap. And that's where the opportunity is. I don't want to bore you with this, but this just tells you in general terms, countrywide, where the opportunity is and what sectors the opportunities are. And you can see energy being one big area of opportunity, right? Power, transport being another, port, logistics, etc., And then of course, other stuff. Again, this is a busy slide, but I'll capture it in one sentence. Then the big irony that I have always found about operating in Africa is that when you go to any country, you see opportunities. Increasingly, you see the political leadership wanting to do something about it. Increasingly, you see the local pensions, life, bank industry, financial sector wanting to get engaged. But if you talk to people who have raised money for Africa, like the large number of PE funds, they will say one thing to you. They will say, but we don't find investments. And that is the biggest irony in Africa today, that somehow 
there is a huge gap between the opportunity set and the actual bankable investment set. And there are reasons for that. And that is why as AFC, we continue to play in that space that how do we translate a need into a project? Because needs don't get investments. Bankable projects do. Which means you have to spend money on project development. You have to carry out stuff like environment studies, community studies, etc. Create the risk mitigations around it to be able to find a project that investors will come into. Now, this slide talks about the rate of growth in terms of population vis-a-vis -vis infrastructure. You know, there is a little joke in Lagos. The joke goes like this, and I don't mean to offend anybody from Nigeria. I myself spent seven days a month in Nigeria. But the joke goes, and it's probably factual, but as I said, never a truer word is spoken than in jest, right? <laughs> is that the rate of population growth in Nigeria is faster than the rate at which a car moves in Lagos. <laughs> and there is a sadness to that comment because it's perhaps true, right? And that kind of tells you that. Good. So, where are we? Where we are is as AFC, a little organization funded by poor little African governments, 12 years back, has managed to prove that you can develop infrastructure in Africa, do so profitably, enjoy a nice credit rating, and receive the support of the global funding community. It can be done, right? But, as I said, what we have achieved is a little drop, little drop. When you look at the infrastructure funding gap of 170 billion, our seven billion is not even a punctuation mark, right? And that is why we see that as a slide that I want you guys to look at, so that as you think of how you're gonna make a difference in terms of your careers, your working life, your conversations, your narratives on Africa. Look at that slide to say there is a big opportunity there. As long as you're willing to be patient and engage. I want to probably elaborate this point because most of us come from environments where we take certain things for granted. So let me just give you an example that today, if you want to build a hospital in a little city in in, a, in, a, in, a, in an African country. You cannot plug and play and do that. You got to build your own energy source. You got to create your own sanitary, plumbing, whatever, whatever. You got to do your own, um, um, what do you call, um, well, in some cases, you got to bring in your nursing staff because they don't exist. In some cases, you got to bring in your doctors because the need is there. The need is there and there is Arguably, an ability to pay also there. But to build a hospital, you have to control all the factors that ultimately make that ship go. So I use the word, I don't know, you, you understand the word, the submarine principle. You know, when a submarine goes under the sea, it is a self-sufficient township. With every aspect of its survival, it is in control of. That's the only way a submarine operates. And that's how I see African businesses, that when you create them, make sure you do not take risks that you're not in control of, okay? Right. I have a few case studies to prove to you that everything I said wasn't theory, it wasn't a figment of my imagination, and most certainly stuff that is not operating at the moment. They're all living examples of our engagement. I'll just give you one example, and Sebastian, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Um, this was a little thing we did in Gabon. We call it the Gabon Special Economic Zone. Now, it started off with a very, very simple thing. Gabon, I don't know how many of you know, it's a little country in West Africa. It was known for its oil exports and timber exports. But like a lot of African countries, neither was the oil being refined in the continent, nor was the wood being processed in the continent, right? So when we went in, we were initially approached by the Gabonese government to build a little port for the hydrocarbon exports to happen and for the refined oil to come in. Simple, very safe investment, no problems, because there is exports and there is imports, the government's paying us. After we went in and built the port, we realized that there is a real case to be built around the timber exports. Because the only people who were, who were able to export the timber were the large plantation owners, because they had the money 
to build their own logistics, their own jetty to export their own wood. And that was marginalizing everybody else. It was creating exploitation of the, sh of the, of the smaller landowners. Then we also discovered that Gabon has a lot of manganese mines, but none of them are big enough for a big mining company to come in, build the entire logistics chain around it. So what did we do? We built a mineral processing export zone, port, jetty. We built a special economic zone to process wood and a port to export it. And then we built the entire railway line and the logistics into the hinterland. What did that do? It immediately made a lot of marginal mines, marginal farmers, commercially viable. Secondly, and most importantly, it added value to the Gabonese economy because no longer were you exporting wood that was not processed, maybe selling it at $20, $20 a ton, and you were processing it so you were getting 10 times that. So that added value, earnings for the government. So just by doing one investment in one country, we changed the whole economic model of that country. We have obviously now taken it further, where we are now using drone technology to replant on a precision basis those trees that are being felled. Okay. So this is just a case of proving to you that why is that investment successful for us? Because we are no longer dependent on the government anymore. We're no longer dependent on a one sector anymore. But we have actually mobilized jobs, beneficiation, revenues, and therefore by itself, it becomes a vastly less risky project for anybody to come and invest in. Net result, we put in $800 million of our own money. What's our net holding position now? $100 million. Who took the 700? European Life and Pension Funds. Why? They love the yield. It's not risky anymore. All the hard work has been done. So that's how we operate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, about 25 minutes. And the way we're going to operate, uh, we're going to open now for questions. And since I'm the chair, I will take advantage and I will ask. Uh, I have lots of questions here, so I will ask just one. So uh, I think it's the elephant in, in the room. Uh, and as soon as we get uh, uh, over with that, we'll open up for, for questions from you guys. And uh, then I will interrupt, and then Jeev will interrupt, and we'll have a great conversation here. So the elephant in the room, I think, um, uh, Sanjeev, uh, is corruption. Uh, <laughs> And uh, we would not be at uh, one of the finest uh, universities in the world if we didn't ask you difficult uh, questions. And I know that you have an answer. Um, so um, if one looks at uh, Transparency International data, uh, Africa is um, the country with the highest perception of corruption. It, uh, it um, uh, <coughs> scores 32 out of 100, where 100 is the country which is perceived to be the least uh, corrupt. Um, so um, I would like you to talk a little bit about that. But let me, let me add a few things. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the positive side of the four countries where the perception of corruption has declined the most in the last <coughs> couple of years, two of those are in Africa. So it may be a bad starting point, but great delta. We're improving fast. Um, and related to the corruption issue, uh, an interesting point that you made is that the AFC is uh, mostly privately owned, but was started by governments. And my understanding, and this could help, uh, and it would be great if you can uh, clarify and expand a little bit, is that it's not the government, but mostly the central banks, the ones who are involved and are shareholders. Um, and uh, in terms, and, and central banks are really all over the world uh, highly respected. In some cases, they are uh, uh, um, also controversial, but highly respected institutions. And it does make a difference if it is the central bank of uh, Tanzania uh, than if it is the sovereign. Um, that, and uh, I, at least I think that it does, both from a risk perspective and from a corruption perspective. So anyway. Let me, I think that, 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 that the conversation would be a little bit sort of, uh, 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 there would be something missing if we don't address head-on this corruption issue, which uh, 
And, and let, let, me, let me just, before I, I, I give the, the, the floor back to you, I emphasize what Transparency International emphasizes in the last few years. This is an index of perception. And then we go back to what uh, uh, Sanjeev was saying at the, at the beginning, the, the divergence between perception and reality in Africa is very, very large, and I would like you to address all these issues. I was hoping that I wouldn't be asked this question. Because, uh, you see how good we are here? No, because I thought you were better, that's why. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, uh, have people, have you, have any of you read this book, The Tale of Two Cities? Uh, yes, of course. It was well, the best of time, it was the worst of time. There you go. So I, I, I feel always a sense of deja vu when I'm asked these questions because, uh, you know, it's very much what you said, that is it the best of times for Africa or is it the worst of times? Is it a season of despair or a season of hope? And we can carry on, right? Uh, as eloquent as Mr. Dickens was. Um, fundamentally, I think, um, and this is not a cop-out answer. This is very much a real answer from a practitioner who operates in a complex environment. <clears throat> it's about a glass half full and a glass half empty story. Do we see improvement? We see improvement. Do we see problems? Yes, we do. Do we see some countries going back? Yes, they are. They are. So it's in that context I want to answer the question of corruption. That when you talk about Africa, you're talking 54 countries, right? You're talking of colonial legacies, which in many ways still holds. There are countries where I can tell you that they owe a certain degree of allegiance towards their ex-colonial masters because of the way the economic model, the currency regime, and so on and so forth works, right? So corruption, therefore, takes two to tango. Right? Why, why is it happening? Who is paying whom? Where is the money being banked? Why is the banking industry not confronting it? So these are questions that nobody likes being asked. So I don't, I don't want to necessarily ask uh, in this forum either. But the bottom line is that when we operate, we are a capital provider. We owe a return to our investors. So very frankly, Sebastian, we operate on what we call the coalition of the willing. If we see issues where there is clearly matters that we cannot feel we can work with, we walk away. And maybe that's why in 12 years we have only invested 7 billion. We could have invested 15. So what am I really therefore saying? I'm saying that largely, largely, and take it from me, till you spend 30 years in Africa and then I'll take it from you, all right? <laughs> that when I go around governments, when I go around business, business people, I see not only a realization, Sebastian, but an acceptance that business has to be done properly. Why? Because first, the African governments themselves are more dependent on global capital. Let me, let me, you, uh, you, you keep talking about the African government, and I try to bring in the distinction between the central banks, mm. uh, which are your shareholders, and, 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 and the governments. Maybe it doesn't make a difference, but I'd like, it's interesting to get your, central banks are very professional. I mean, for me, dealing with Ben Ondulo in Tanzania was not different from dealing with people at the Federal Reserve Board or the Bank of England. I mean, the, the, the level of professionalism of Ben and his staff. Does it make a difference? Do you feel that the fact that the shareholders, when, when, when you have a shareholders meeting, these are uh, not politicians, sure. but civil servants, uh, highly, it doesn't make a difference? No, Sebastian, you make a good point, because it does. I'll tell you why, and, and maybe that's why I want us to give credit to the founders of ASC, that it was originally conceived by prime ministers and presidents, please remember, it wasn't conceived by central banks, right? right? But somewhere in the, in the thinking, uh, one of the greatest men in Africa, in my view, is the ex-president of Nigeria, President Obosanjo. It's another thing that Nigeria has so many good things to offer. Do you know that African Development Bank, for example, was originally conceived and created by Nigeria. People forget about that. So President Obosanjo was probably a visionary, where when he created us, he said that the shareholding will come through the central banks. So maybe because he knew what, what you are trying to allude to. So obviously it makes a difference because the board members are professional people. They've all done stints in World Bank and IMF. They have their professional pedigree to protect. But that doesn't still take away the question you ask, that is there corruption in Africa? And the answer I would still like to give you is there is corruption everywhere. It depends on what you call it. You can call it institutionalized corruption. You can call it lobbying. You can call it royalty payments. In Africa, it tends to be more blatant, more naked. 
more on your face, and therefore you got to avoid it. Yeah. Okay, let's open up. That I think clears that part, and we, uh, we don't want elephants in the room. So let me open up for questions. We have a mic that we're going to circulate. So let's start over here. We have two questions here, so you can uh, ask the first one and then uh, share the mic with your colleague, and then we'll, we'll get going. So thank you so much for being here. I uh, really enjoyed the talk. Um, my background is in wind energy, and um, it seems like a lot of the renewable energy companies have been investing in Africa. And you know, to what degree? I'm you know, there's always different photos on on websites, and uh, I think it's very exciting to think that um, certain communities can be electrified. You know, starting renewable, that you can just skip the fossil fuel phase. And um, and the grid can be built out in a uh, responsible way that um, kind of sets you up for success. And I'm curious what what uh, AFC is doing to ensure that things are are done in a smart um, kind of forward looking way in the energy sector. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a big issue you've touched on, and I'll tell you why, because it touches on a lot of emotions personally and as, as a corporation. Without meaning to be controversial, I will just share with you that there is a general feeling amongst a lot of us in Africa who are doing the work that is required that this coal agenda, and it's now becoming a gas and oil agenda as well, is another way of stifling the continent. And there has been debates in global forums around it, right? It is beginning to affect us because even rating agencies are using it as a criteria. How much of renewables are you doing vis a vis others? It's also becoming a criteria because more and more global banks are not investing in projects that have this. So we obviously therefore are mindful of it, right? The way we approach it is very simple. And in fact, there was an article in Wall Street Journal the other day where if you see that even in the developed world, people are spending more money on coal technology than on, on, on renewables. So it's not that people have stopped doing something, whilst in Africa, with the base load challenge that you have, how can you really meet that base load challenge by just doing renewables? It's not going to happen. I'll give you another example, Rwanda, right? Small country, no coal, no gas, no oil. We found peat there. And we realized there is technology available from Finland to make peat into power. Now, you can argue that that's leaving a seriously negative carbon footprint. We are arguing that that's developing Rwanda. So which part of the SDG goals do you want to get into? Right? So you can see there's a lot of passion here, so I'll, I'll move away from that. <laughs> Specifically to answer your question, it is, it, is, it is almost remarkable that when I see my deal pipeline today on power, energy, almost 70% of my deals that I'm looking at are all renewables. You will be happy to know that the first wind power station that was ever done in Africa in a place called Cape Verde, we did it. We are doing a Djibouti wind power project now, right? We're doing a hydro in Cote d'Ivoire. Okay, we're doing another solar in Nigeria. So yes, of course we'll do renewables, but we cannot look at renewables as the only way to provide the solution for energy in Africa. I'll give you an example. Today, 70% of the gas in Nigeria is flared out. Now you're saying I won't use the gas to produce power? It has to happen, right? So I don't know whether I've answered your question, but the point I'm trying to make is that the world must accept that we can't start running when we haven't started walking. And there are abundance of fossil fuels which can create the base load solution before we bring in renewables as a way of adding to it. And that's how we are approaching the problem. Okay. So what I'm going to do now, because of the time, we're going to get two or three questions, and then hopefully you'll answer both of them in one sentence. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yes. I guess my question is sort of AFC's position in juxtaposition to other infrastructure uh, financers and developers in Africa, and specifically with the China Belt and Road Initiative. Um, this last summer I was in Kenya and really um, blown away by how quickly the SGR uh, was built between Mombasa and Nairobi and how excited people were about it. And I guess I'm curious about how you see AFC's position in, in developing infrastructure as different as either in partnership or sort of in competition with those funders? Based really on my own ignorance, because I'm, I would love to he learn the answer, not that I have a, an agenda here. And also, um, 
it, it, and it really concerns the nature of, of the growth rates in Africa and what, what those curves really mean, not in terms of, of return on capital, but in terms of income. And why are income levels not improved across the board by so many of the uh, capital investment projects that are even successful? Okay, so it's two very unrelated questions. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Uh, but I'll try and they, are, they, they, they have Africa in common. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And me in the middle. <laughs> and so maybe I'll take yours first, uh, out of respect for age and seniority. Um, um, <laughs> you don't do that <laughs> no, I, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question in the sense that why is GDP growth? That's what your question is. Is not necessarily uh, leading to greater per capita income and employment creation. I think that's pretty much your question. I think, uh, firstly, I don't know which, whether you're looking at Africa-wide data and then planting the, the Africa-wide data on top, or are you looking at regions and countries? Because uh, if you probably go a little more granular, you might, see start, you might start seeing more relationship between that, number one. Number two, my Gabon example is a good way to answer the question otherwise, that a lot of African GDP growth in the recent decade and decade and a half has been resource-led, right? Uh, has probably helped the exchequer, but hasn't created beneficiation and jobs. Therefore, hasn't percolated down to employment levels. The Gabon example is a good one, where suddenly, by just one project, we have managed to create jobs. So I think it's two things. One is the granularity of the data needs to be seen a bit more. And secondly, how much of the GDP growth has been mining, oil and gas led, uh, and not percolated down to real jobs in the real economy. So, but I'm happy to have this discussion because I kind of see the context of what you're saying. On your question, China, yeah, China is, China is important to Africa, contrary to popular belief. Mm. It has played a, I won't use the word stellar because that's an opinion, but it's played a very significant role in, in Africa's growth in the last 15, 20 years. China is not a shareholder of the AFC? No. Do you have non-African shareholders? No. It's going to change in the next few months, but no, and not at this moment. No. Okay. <clears throat> but China, <clears throat> China has historically tended to operate on a G2G level. So private sector institutions like us have had difficulty working with them and also match their pricing. Like they're building a road in Djibouti and they're giving money at 0.5%. I can't match it, right? So, so forget it. But in the recent past, China has realized that it is smarter for them to work through their institutions and work with African institutions. So I'll give you an example. Therefore, the China Exim has given us a $400 million line. They would have never done that before. They would have gone directly into projects. So that collaboration is happening. Uh, as far as working with other institutions is concerned, it's a given. We actually use the word cooperation. Because the need is so huge, and the, our, our little balance sheet is so small that we work with everybody. So on any average project, in fact, even in this one, you will see IFC sometimes. You will see the African Development Bank, Afroexim Bank. You will see the European DFIs as well, FMO, DEG, Proparco. OPIC is not that involved. And the newly formed Development Finance Corporation in the US, DFC, they're trying to get in, but they have some. What about IFC? Yeah, IFC uh, is obviously... That's a, the World Bank, private, for those of you who don't know this. They, it's a private sector arm of Private the sector arm of the World Bank International Finance uh, Corporation. So the IFC is an important uh, entity to work with because they bring a lot of resilience, if you like, a lot of long-termism to their thinking and a lot of credibility and allows us to manage political risks better. But in the very recent past, not a criticism on IFC, IFC has been through their own little upheaval. Sure. So in the last couple of years, it's been difficult to engage with them. <laughs> um, I guess to follow up on your question on IFC, to what extent, if any, do you guys utilize MEGA, the insurance policy through the World Bank? Quite a bit. As you saw from the chart, there was mention of MEGA because um, we, remember I also said that risk management is critical to us. So we would rather give away a few basis points of return and sleep easy knowing certain risks are insured. So MEGA is a big part of that. But then there are other contenders for it, right? So ATI is there. And then increasingly, in fact, one of our largest projects, which was a 700 million euro refinancing of a refinery, we got insurance from Lloyd's. 
So the Lloyd's market is getting active as well. Let me, let me, There's money to be made, so that's why the private sector yeah. is coming. So let me, let me ask you a, a question that is I, I, not so much related to AFC, but uh, one of the news that really disturbed me today in the Financial Times is that SAA, South African Airways, is cutting down on flights and uh, it may actually go bankrupt. And one of the issues, of course, and a legacy of colonialism is that it's very difficult to travel within Africa. And uh, Jayberg was a very good um, uh, a hub in, in some ways. I mean, I, I used to go to uh, Sao Paulo to do research and then fly. There was a wonderful nonstop from Sao Paulo to Jayberg that Correct. was canceled. There was one from Buenos Aires that was canceled. Um, w w just about the uh, South African areas, I mean, how, what's, ah, you my, just your opinion, I mean, I, you come to my favorite topic, I'll tell you. Ah, that. great. Because I was just talking to one of your students, uh, sorry, I forget your name, um, and, I, and she asked me, I used to live in South Africa, and I moved from South Africa and live in Dubai now, and I've been living in Dubai for 12 years, but I do business, I travel a lot into Asia, Europe, and Africa, of course. And, and the reason I live in Dubai is I joke, I say that Dubai is Africa's best connected airport, right? <laughs> okay. And, and, and there is a truism to it, because Africa is perhaps the only continent I know where you have to sometimes leave Africa to come back to Africa, right? Well, also, also South America. Yeah. Sometimes you have to go back to Miami. So there you are. If you are, if you are in uh, Colombia, it's better to go back to Miami there if you, you want to go to BA. There you are. Yeah. So, so it, is, it is a shame that South African Airways, which was probably the best airline potentially to have taken off that load, no pun intended, of, of actually flying people around Africa. But that load has been taken over by Ethiopian Airways. Right. You know, Addis is, is a seriously important and a working hub for doing business in Africa. Right? So, again, one bad story matched by another good story. But yes, I agree with you that uh, it's not just airlines, it's even trade, right? If you look at the railway map of Africa, you will see that all railway lines lead outwards. Right. Essentially, one mine to the port, one mine to the port. That's the historical colonial legacy. How do you integrate to create trade? This much wanted CFTA, the Common Free Trade Agreement that Africa has signed, it's not going to happen unless Africa is connected, sure. right? Uh, I was wondering, uh, for smaller businesses that might not have the resources that AFC has, how do they overcome the infrastructure challenges in terms of, are there pockets in Africa where the infrastructure is built in or economic zones where they can set up the businesses? Yeah, so it's a good question. Gabon. Good example. You go to Gabon now, special economic zone has 400 small businesses. You go to uh, Ethiopia, same thing. Okay. Uh, Nigeria has some special economic zones as well, which provides power, water, whatever, whatever, same technology, whatever, sorry, bandwidth, etc. But it is still a problem. I, I remember the point I made earlier on that one of the biggest obstacles about doing business in Africa as an entrepreneur is you can't plug and play. You can't take the other factors for granted and your idea to take forward. You've got to get the basic factors sorted, right? It's improving, but it's a challenge. And it's also a challenge because credit is a problem. Small businesses don't get credit very easily. SME funding is a big challenge, right? It's improving again, but then I'm an optimist. Everyone will say, has it improved enough? Um, E-commerce businesses, for example, struggle because logistics, right? I mean, how can e-commerce operate without it, right? So it is a problem. The successful family-owned small businesses have succeeded when they have found a little niche for themselves and got the price points correct and managed their own distribution. That's the way it had, they have succeeded. So you said that you're, you were talking about this submarine principle, right? That you have to bring everything your, yourself. So if you are, uh, maybe your initiative is kind of helping with the financing part of that. Are there any other initiatives that are helping with all the rest? Like dealing with government, dealing with logistics, dealing with all the... I don't know, different compliance that you need in order to, for example, operate your own hospital? Yeah, so, you know, I, I kind of use the word the coalition of the willing. What I meant by that is that there are countries which are more business friendly or business ready than others. So one has to make a decision. So, for example, there is a natural cue towards certain countries because of the way the governments, the authorities, the frameworks, the legislative environment, the currency regime, the logistics work in your favor. And there are some countries where in spite of obvious size, things do not happen. So that's the one thing. The second thing I'll tell you is that almost all the 
working African governments, because out of the 54 countries, not all African countries are working countries in my view. Some of them best left not touched. You have firstly a huge amount of political intent. In fact, the most pleasing thing which I should have mentioned is that there has been a big emergence of the African diaspora. You know, the African diaspora has started playing a big role back into their continent. So much so that even at the political level, in a lot of the countries, the ministers of finance, the governors, the prime ministers, the presidents, are African professionals going back. That helps in terms of the conversation. Through many institutions and the World Bank particularly, there is capacity building programs going on. Because the other challenge you have in doing business in Africa sometimes is that you want to build a power station. You want to have a PPP framework for that, right? But who do you go and engage with in the government? So there have been cases where we ourselves have paid for a lawyer for the government to work with us. So we pay the lawyer to negotiate with us, OK? Because otherwise things don't move. That's fine, because at least things move. So to come back to your question, the intent is, is much better today. The institutional buildup is, is much better. Currency regimes are much more uh, sort of, you know, more comfortable to work in. And more importantly, the, the global funding environment has changed towards Africa, where people are looking at capital and deploying it on a patient basis. So hopefully all of this bodes well for the future. Okay. But it's a coalition of the willing. Do not take the continent as one case. It can be very, very granular. To end on a positive note, what's in your pipeline of upcoming projects that makes you uh, that most excites you? Um, are you shifting your portfolio mix uh, across infrastructure, transportation, et cetera, or like what's just exciting you? You want to take one more? Or is it a uh, well, yeah. Let, why don't we do that? One, one more, and <laughs> and uh, you can combine the. And my question is around microfinance and the role that it's playing in Africa right now. I've read a little bit about it and, you know, giving loans on the, like, the amount of like a cow or something small for a family or a small community. How is that improving Africa's situation? Okay. So very quickly, sector-wise, we see huge opportunities in the transport, logistics, and energy. And that excites us because there is a natural taker for it, be it the mining industry, be it the, the consumers, et cetera. So our deal pipeline today is virtually infested, if that's the right word, <laughs> with, with energy and transportation and logistics deal. Very quickly, I'll tell you that we are adopting what we call an ecosystem approach, where we don't want to just invest in a mine. If you want to invest in a mine, we want to build the power. If you want to build the power, we want to build the roads. If you want to build the roads, we want to build the port, so that the whole ecosystem is managed by us, and it feeds off each other and mitigates the risk. So that's how we are approaching things, okay? And it works for us. Uh, microfinance. Yeah, it's part of the SME financing question. Uh, microfinance has almost been Africa's credit card, in the lack of a credit card uh, sort of environment. The thing is that there are pockets in Africa where microfinance works very well, and there is some great business models that's come out of it. One of them I was myself involved with, a company called Lechego. You can Google them. Uh, it's listed on the Botswana Stock Exchange. Uh, it provides uh, uh, sm short-term, small loans to employed people against a pay deduction code. So the credit risk is virtually zero. In South Africa, you have the Stockwell concept, which is like you know, lending against whatever, it's small time needs. The biggest thing about micro lending that we see in the data, and maybe people have not seen that data, is that the actual default ratios are very low. And, 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 and the experience is good. And that's because probably because of peer pressure or because it's necessity driven, right? So, where the microfinance is probably going to head up, land up rather, is actual traditional banks are now going into mobile payment system, like you know, and, and sorry, and telecom companies. Yeah, so you know M-Pesa yeah. makes a big difference, but now more and more conventional banks are building networks like that. And I think that's where the future will be. So it's fulfilling a need while you didn't have that banking infrastructure. Yeah. We, we uh, this is interesting uh, to, to end uh, how we can get cross-regional uh, 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 fertilization. Uh, a group, uh, some of, the, of you are here. We went to Peru in, uh, back in, uh, when was it? November? December? I forget when it was. September. <laughs> but one of the, in, the, in, the, in the microfinance, some of the banks, the formal banks, are getting into it, and they're using behavioral finance. So uh, in the Latin American tradition, when girls turn 15, there's a big party. So mothers go there and say, I want to have a 15 
uh, uh, birthday party for my, for my daughter and I want 400 people and I want this kind of menu and they go five years in advance and they tell them this is how much you have to save every week if you go, if you want that kind of celebration, if you want fewer guests or you want more and they are now using this interaction where it's gold, I don't know if Africa, in Africa it's, that is. Very good example I'll give you. Firstly, Grameen Bank in Bangladesh proved that peer pressure is the best way of right. managing risk, right? But here it's also but this one is aspirational. Great. I'll tell you, exactly, I'll tell you, in, Af in certain, some parts of Africa, funeral is big, right? Right. It's like the Egyptian pharaohs, they plan their funerals, right? So we created a business which provides funeral insurance. So when you die, we pay your family so much so that your funeral can be held properly, right? We kind of extended it a little more, now the guy can choose his coffin as well, but that's a different <laughs> matter, right? But so yeah, absolutely. Making, making that money there is out a of need, the dead. There is a need against which people save, and we create a create Beautiful. a business model around. Sanjeev, thank, thank you. you so much for coming. Thank it was wonderful. Thank you.